Hello everybody and welcome to the Digitally Uploaded Podcast, the companion podcast to digitallydownloaded.net. I'm Matt, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of That There website and I am the host today. With us this week we have Harvard. Hello Harvard. Hello. And we have Trent. That hello was very Australian. It was it it woke me up. <laughs> well, I'm glad the Australian accent wakes you up, Trent. That's a good thing to know. I I hadn't known that before. <laughs> but it's good to have you on the podcast here. So we're going to do our usual thing. We're going to have some Hatsune Miku music and then we're going to talk about the games that are coming out next month. I haven't even looked at the list yet, so this is going to be fun. You're going to see my live reactions to seeing what's actually coming out over the next week, couple of weeks. Okay, Mickey Music. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that wonderful piece of music. I'm sure Alan really enjoyed editing it into the podcast. Okay, so this week or this month, apparently we've got a lot of stuff coming. That's what Harvard tells me during the little break we had there. And that's cool. Just what I needed, more games to play. So we'll start with the PlayStation 5, shall we? Let's start with that. Surely there are not many games coming out on that thing because nothing comes out on that thing. Um, Should have started with the Xbox then. (laughs) 
<laughs> nobody, nobody plays the Xbox. It's a figment of your imagination, Trent. All well, right. I have the Xbox. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So there are two big games straight off the bat. Uh, July 6th brings us Watch Dogs Legion Bloodline. That's DLC for Watch Dogs if you're into that open world nonsense from Ubisoft. Um, but I guess the bigger one on July 6th is A Plague Tale Innocence, which is... Is that the? Is that just the port of the last one? Is that the... It sounds is, like I think it was Innocence last time. Yeah. So there is a sequel coming to a Plague Tale. There's a new a Plague Tale coming. Um, I'm not sure it needed a sequel, but there is one. But I think yeah, that I mean people would have bought that. It's a real timely <laughs> game. Uh, but I think the 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 PlayStation Five is just getting a, maybe an updated port of it. It looks like from the box art, it looks like it is the original characters. So there you go. Uh, it was a very good game. Uh, probably well worth playing, and I will probably play it again if the update on the PlayStation 5 is decent enough. On July 6th as well, there's a game called Indigo 7 Quest for Love. I don't know what that is, but I'm sure it's good, um, because why not? On July 6th, there's Elder Lily's Quietest of the Nights, which has a nice little art. I don't know what that's about either, but... There we go. Maybe this is going to be a recurring theme of these lists. I don't know what a lot of these games are about because I just haven't been paying attention. I do know that on July 8, uh, there's a game called Heart of the Woods coming out. Now, this is a visual novel. It's a Yuri-themed one, and it is very good, apparently. Does it also uh, have nice art? It has very lovely art. All Yuri games have lovely art. It's kind of the point of them. Um, but, yeah, this one is... I, I know this one has a very good reputation, so yeah, I'll. Uh, I, it's coming out on Nintendo Switch as well. That's what I'll play it on. But if you are interested in dipping your toes into a Yuri VNs, then that one will probably be a good place to start. On July 13, if you like your vroom vrooms, then F1 2021 comes out. That'll be the first PlayStation 5 F1 game. So there you go. It'll also be the first one that Codemasters has produced since becoming acquired by EA. So that'll be interesting as well. They've been on a pretty good... Um, they, ha they have been on a pretty good trend over the last couple of months. So... Oh, sorry. No, it's, 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 the last it's couple of iterations. Be, it's the going last to be couple the COVID iterations. version. It's going to basically... <laughs> it's basically as the tracks slowly get cut off because uh, the COVID uh, spikes up, they're going to remove it from the video game. It's the, it's the EA COVID edition. <laughs> Yeah, you actually you actually just don't do any racing because all the races get cancelled. <laughs> that's that, that's the way it's working. No, I am looking forward to it. The uh, the F1 series has been in a pretty good groove over the last couple of iterations, so I, I'm certainly looking forward to see what they can do on the PlayStation Five with it. Uh, here's a one that I've been looking forward to a great deal. Chris Tales comes out on July 20. Now, Chris Tales is a JRPG inspired by Chrono Trigger and kind of the Super NES classics, but it is created by South Americans, Colombians, I believe it was, yes, Colombians. And they are very, very open about them wanting to kind of express Colombian culture through this game too. So, yeah, it could be one of the first super, uh, super one of the first kind of Super Nintendo inspired um, South American JRPGs. So, yeah, it, it looks really lovely too. It has a really nice art style and... I think it's going to be something special. Do you see it's on the PS5? It is coming on PlayStation 5, also Nintendo Switch. And we'll get to that when we start talking about the Switch. I think it's also a PS4 thing. but That's um, a real power move to release an SNES-inspired game on the PS5. Yep, that's using the power of the console the right way, if you ask me. Um, what do we got? Last stop. Last stop is a single-player third-person narrative adventure game set in present-day London where you play as three separate characters who worlds collide in the midst of a supernatural crisis. That sounds pretty good. That's coming out on July 22. Uh, July 27, you've got Tribes of Midgard, which is a strategy game thing, I think. Um, oh, the PlayStation 5 port of Yonder comes out on July 27 as well. That was a really lovely non-violent open world game that was released what, about four years ago now. Uh, it's an Australian-developed one, too, and it's really, really lovely. So hopefully the PlayStation 5 port is good. Um, and that's about it. 
there is one kind of indie pixel art Bosch Rush game called Eldest Souls coming out on July 29. I think it's they're just playing on souls. <laughs> they're just trying to sell themselves on having souls in their name. Um, I don't know about that. So anyway, Peter's offer towards the end of the month, but it's a pretty strong month through the month for the PlayStation 5. Over on the PlayStation 4, what else have we also got? A lot of the stuff I already mentioned. The Silver Case 2425 comes out on July 6. Now that is Goichi Suda's incredibly dark, noirish uh, visual novel, which, uh, and this pack contains both the original and the sequel. They are excellent games, very much worth playing. So I'm glad to see that Nipponichi has bring bringing them out, out as a kind of a collection for people, because I don't think enough people have played Goichi Suda's visual novels. They're very good. Um, going through, there's a lot of games coming out. I'm scrolling a lot, but I'm not just I'm just not going to mention them because most of them are not particularly interesting. Um. On July 16, Observer System Redux comes out. I believe that's a sequel to Observer, which was actually a pretty decent... Um, it, it was a pretty decent visual novel by Bloober Team with a kind of cyberpunk horror vibe to it. Uh, and it had Rutger Hauger doing the voice work for the lead character, which isn't <laughs> going to happen now. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with that. But... It is a pretty good world they've got for themselves and worth keeping an eye on to see how that turns out. On July 20, we have a Akiba's Trip, Hellbound and Debriefed coming out. That's <laughs> that's going to be fun. I like Akiba's Trip. Debriefed, that's a, good, that's a good joke. Debriefed is very good. <laughs> so Akiba's Trip is basically this open world parody game where you run around and beat up people and basically remove their clothes because they're vampires. And <laughs> that's that's the concept of the game. Um, it's fan servicey, but not ridiculously so. It's more kind of comedy. It's not designed to be sexy, that's for sure. And yeah, this is the remake of the very original Kiva Strip. So that'll be a good place to start if you've ever been curious about that series. Uh, we've got more of the same, more of the same. More of the same. Orcs Must Die 3 comes out on July 23. Now, I quite liked Orcs Must Die. That's the action tower defense combination. So you put your little towers down to stop the orcsies from running down and destroying your crystal or whatever. And then you actually get to run around and fight them as well. So that's been a pretty reliable series for the better part of a decade now. And the third one is coming out on July 23. The big one, I think, for Trent, <laughs> July 27 brings Neo, The World Ends With You, which is the sequel to The World Ends With You, which nobody thought we'd ever get, but we've got. And Neo doesn't look like it's anything like <laughs> the previous one, which will be interesting to see how people respond to it. I played the demo. I'm, I'm hyped. I, You're I'm hyped? The, I, I'm on the hype train. I've played the demo. It's going to be great. But I'm going to buy it on the Switch, not the PS4. <laughs> oh, so, so you mean they put out a demo for a game and you're interested in it because the demo worked? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Successful demo, people. That's how you do it. Uh, on July 27, Samurai Warriors 5 comes out, and I'm very happy about this. I'm over the moon about this. I do like my Sam was, and yeah, I'm looking forward to some more historical action. I've been to most of the places that those games depict these days. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I'm definitely deeply invested in Samurai Warriors. It's been a while since we had the last one. Hopefully this one does a good job. Has a new art style and stuff. On July 27 as well, we have the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, which is a two-pack, isn't it? It's two, isn't it? It's a two-pack of the Ace Attorney games that were set way back when. Um, and it's a predecessor to Phoenix Wright. It's one of his, it's his grandfather, I think, isn't it? Great grandfather. Featuring uh how do you say it? Herlock Sholmes. Yes, and Herlock Sholmes as well. Uh it, it's it's gonna be more great ace it's gonna be more ace attorney of course, but it is set in an earlier time period, so 
it has that quaint look about it. I'm sure it's going to be excellent. They do have a good reputation, those two games that are in the pack. So this is the first time that they're being localized into English, I believe. And that's good for people too. I feel like it's like the Pokemon game coming out, which is like really set far back in time. Just don't think about that. Does Detective it Pikachu or Pokemon Conquests? No, or... the, the one set in like medieval Japan. Have you what? missed all? Have you missed all oh, the? Oh, you mean the, the open world RCS game? Yes. Yes. Ah, yes. It's like medieval and stuff like that. Just, just don't think it exists. It, see, well, the concept exists, but like where it fits on the timeline, just don't think about that. <laughs> right. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, moving on uh, to the Switch. Let's do the Switch. Switch, of course, has oh, Jesus Christ. I'm still scrolling through June games. The Switch has a lot of games coming out. Um, oh, okay. So we start off with one which is actually intriguing me because it, the the entire kind of the box art as such is just Japanese characters. And I'm fascinated by what this game offers potentially. It's called Red, White, Yellow. Now, if you go and have a look at it in the Switch store, it's like a Lumines style kind of puzzle game with a really neat vibe. It's got a really nice art style. It's... Yeah, it, it looks really, really neat. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, come, came, uh, excuse me, came out of nowhere, but I've got it on my list. Um, what do we got? What do we got? Scrolling through, trying to make this quite as brief as possible. Just picking the main ones here. If you haven't played East Nine yet, East Nine comes out on July six for the Switch. It is actually a very good game. I really enjoyed it on the PlayStation 4. That one, so, Monstrum Nox. Yes, Monstrum Nox. It's a darker East. Most of the Easts are all very... <laughs> I hate saying East. It's such a terrible <laughs> word. But most most of the other Easts are pretty light and bubbly, or if not light and bubbly, at least more kind of traditional fantasy. This one definitely dips into a very darker place. So, yeah, that's a different tone. It's, it's a good game. It is a very good game. Um... Oh, The Plague Tale Innocence comes out on Switch 2 on July 6th, so I might play it on Switch again. Have it on the go. Or the Mices. Cute little Mices. They're not cute in that game. Usually mice are cute. Um, oh, cool. So Monster Hunter Stories 2 Wings of Ruin comes out on July 9th. That is Monster Hunter, but actually RPG rather than stupidly difficult combat game. So I'm looking forward to that. I've always liked Monster Hunter um, a, a great deal, but I do struggle with it a little bit because I'm not that good at it. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, having an RPG set in that kind of Monster Hunter universe, it seems like it is going to be very much my kind of thing. So that comes out on July 9, exclusively for Switch for now, or Switch and PC. Soon. Yeah, it did come out pretty soon after Rise. Yeah, Rise was like March, wasn't it? Yep. Oh, got interesting. To, got to hit the nail while it's hot. Um, yeah, this one has caught my attention. Lambs on the Road at the Beginning. It's um, an adventure platformer with small puzzles, but it looks like it has a really interesting art style. It is a post-apocalyptic kind of setting, and it might just be one of those games that hooks me in just on its premise, its name, its art and stuff. Seems like it is a game that has been thought about in development and that's what i always like to see looks like they've taken a good and um considered look at what they can do with the apocalyptic setting plus the platforming on july 16 you can get the legend of zelda skyward sword hd which is the worst of the all the zelda games and on top of that you can then buy the amiibo to make it playable which is <laughs> <laughs> which is good that's a good deal Wait, did I pre-order the Amiibo yet? <laughs> uh, to be a little bit more clear about it, the it is perfectly playable without the Amiibo, but there is a major kind of benefit feature locked into the Amiibo, which is the fast travel feature. Uh, if you want to take advantage of that, you need to have the Amiibo. So, don't know if I approve of Nintendo doing this, but they're doing it. They're definitely I'm doing sure it. I'm sure it's like a, a dip in the water. How do you say it? Like dipping the toe in the water to see how far they can get away with this before they, before they inevitably ramp it up for whatever next game they have. Yeah, I, I think they didn't. They already announced that another game uses amiibos in a way that 
you kind of have to have the Mi Amiibo. Isn't the Metroid one like that? Oh, yeah, I the Metroid Metro one, that's yeah. the one. Yeah, the Metroid one has, like, some major feature that's locked into the Amiibo, so... It's okay, kind of... I bought the Amiibo, I'm prepared. You're yeah, part well... of the problem, Trent. <laughs> Yeah, stop, <laughs> stop enabling them, Trent. You know what was cool? The Metroid Amiibo, which had the little gooey, like, Metroid character. So, like, the top head was really, really gooey, and there was, like, a different texture. That was fun. They that should do something like that again. Kind the, of only, gross. the only Amiibo I've ever bought is the giant Yoshi. The giant plush Yoshi. And that's because it's a plush. It's not because it's a functional Amiibo. I, I have a tiny one. one. You got the tiny one? The tiny one was cute, too. But yeah, the giant plush Yoshi. That was a collectible. Um, Chris Tales does come out on the Switch as well on July 20. So does Akiba's Trip. You can play that on the train. I'm sure people will not look at you funny if you're playing that on the train. Um, Pronouncing that title so carefully, can I just say? <laughs> yes, it, I mean, it is obviously a, a play on the... If you pronounce it in another way, the title in another way, then it becomes kind of a... Description of the way that the game plays. <laughs> um, what else we got? What else we got? We've got, we've got Neo, The World Comes With You on July 27. That's coming out on the Switch as well. So is Sam Was. So is The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. So you can basically play everything that's coming out on the other consoles on the Switch this month. Isn't that good? Even Samurai Warriors? Yep. That yeah. seems like a stretch. No, it should work. I mean, the Switch has Dynasty Warriors 8, 9, 8. It doesn't have 9. Does not have, it does not have, yeah, I, I, I always get confused about the numbers because the numbers in Australia compared to Japan or the West compared to Japan are, are different. So, um, yeah, the the Switch on the has, has Dynasty Warriors 9. It has Hyrule Warriors, you know, those two games. It's got Fire Emblem Warriors. It can obviously handle the Warriors engine. Uh, it's got okay. Persona 5 Strikers. So it can obviously handle the engine. Uh, I'm sure it'll play just fine on the Switch as well. That'll be the one I play it on, I think. Just because I like to play things on the Switch. All right. One final one. I'm actually looking forward to this just because it seems like it could be good from the, uh, the, the Switch description box. The... Game's called Horror Tales: The Wine that comes out on July 30, and you explore a post-pandemic fictional Mediterranean island and confront your nemesis. So it's Mediterranean horror, <laughs> whatever that means. Uh, and you've got a—it's a stalker horror thing. You've got to run and hide from something that's hunting you down. So it could just be a, a good horror game that's coming out on Switch. That's coming out on the 30th. So there we go. That is the list of games in a very kind of truncated form. There's an awful lot of stuff that's coming that I haven't mentioned, but I think oh, those are the main ones. Um, Death Store. I, is that PC only? I would imagine so. I didn't see it on the list. Oh, so. okay. That's July 20 by Devolver, Devolver Digital. It is a very oh, good top-down isometric combat exploration game. Yes, that's right, because you've been playing the preview build of that. So Yeah, I don't know how much I can say, <laughs> except that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad that that's turning out as something that you're going to mention for people to put onto their list of things to watch. But yeah, that's definitely a PC only game. So we'll start with you, Trent. Oh, wait, I know which one you're going to say. <laughs> which which game are you looking forward to the most, Trent? Well, you know, I, it could be Skyward Sword. It could be um, the it's... ancient um, Phoenix Wright, you know, it could be them. But no, it's not, it's, 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 not, it's not set in ancient time, dude. They're not doing the court cases in the caves. It's like it's, steampunk <laughs> Phoenix Wright. That would be a great game, though. Cave Phoenix Wright. Cave Phoenix Wright. I'll get murder with flame. I'll get murder. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but no, yes, it is Neo. Neo is probably the one I'm most excited. But I'm still going to play Skyward Sword and all that. So, yeah. Well, yeah, we probably should mention that. Yeah, when we each month we say which game we're looking forward to the most in the month. That's not the only game we actually play. <laughs> we, we we all play a lot of awful lot of games, but yes, the, Speak the one to yourself. I consistently do not play the game. I say I'm going to look forward to it every month. <laughs> what all did right. I say last month? Because I I'm really into Mario Golf right now. Did that that that's like really really great. Like, what did I say last month? Can, I don't think you said that. Different. 
No, I don't think you said Mario Golf. In but fact, I, I can I can check because I've written it down. You said. I, I agree with you, Trent. Actually, Mario Golf is excellent. Very good. I, I was surprised. I was very worried going into it because they haven't managed to do a good Mario sports game in quite a while. But this one is excellent. I just think it's fun because you get run. And then you can run. <laughs> can run. Yeah, she's I think you boy. said Scarlet Nexus, Trent. Did you play that? No, I have not played that yet. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> is it on Game Pass? I'll probably pick it up and play it in July. I don't, think it's, That's I don't why... think it's on Xbox, is it? Yeah, it's on Xbox. Oh, it's on Xbox. Dude, that, was the, that, was, that was the one that Microsoft was going all in on as selling the Xbox to Japanese audiences. We thought that was going to be exclusive to Xbox for oh, eight. And yeah. then they put it on everything. Yeah, then they put it on everything. So you can play it on PlayStation now. Oh. Well, they didn't put it on Switch. They should put it on Switch. There's no reason it can't be on Switch. It's not that you know, technically demanding. They could just downgrade it a little bit and stick it on Switch, if you ask me. Uh, okay, but anyway, that's a different discussion for another time. Harvard, which we're playing you... Neo, and I am playing. Hmm. Didn't think about this one. I might try Chris Tail, actually. Chris Tail? Chris Tail? Because... Yeah, I don't know if it's Chris Tail or Chris Tail, but I'm saying Chris Tails until corrected otherwise. Yeah, I'll, I'll check it out because I'm always good for old school style JRPGs. It's a good month to get some grinding done. Yeah, I don't know how much grinding is involved. They definitely seem to be quite, because I have done a little interview with them, they definitely seem to be interested in modernizing the JRPG, but not in an offensive way. Hmm, <laughs> not, in a, not, not in a way that kind of craps over the, um, the the traditions of the genre. They they just seem to be very genuinely in love with old school JRPGs, and they want to do a homage to it, but in a way that's accessible to modern players. And in the process, also teach people a little bit about Colombian culture and history and art and stuff so yeah that sounds great do you know what kind of angle the colombian culture is is it like a mythology thing or a history thing or like a fantasy thing yeah it seems to be like a they, they've used the colombian mythology and kind of you know stories of yesteryear as a basis for a lot of the stuff that they've pulled into this game so you will be getting a, an authentic Colombian story, whatever that means. I haven't, <laughs> had, I haven't had much exposure to, to kind of Colombian culture, so that's one of the reasons that I'm quite interested in this game because it could be a, a launching point. It could give me stuff, you know, notes to take to start to learn a little bit more about uh, Colombia, which would yeah. be good. All I and know is um... that's ultimately what I want video games to do. You know, I want, I want, especially JRPGs to be coming from every corner of the world because you do learn a lot potentially from the stories that they can tell. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, I'm definitely interested in Chris Tales as well, but for my pick this month, I've got to go with Samurai Warriors. <laughs> I, I have to. Um, it was actually Samurai Warriors 3 back on the Wii, which got me into the entire Warriors ecosystem and genre and stuff. I hadn't played one before that. And I picked up Samurai Warriors 3, and because of that game, I got really interested, not just in the Warriors series or the Warriors formula or whatever you want to call it, but also I got really into Japanese history um, because of that game. It gave me a whole lot of names to start researching, a whole lot of places to visit in Japan, and I have spent many, much time in the many years since doing, following up on all of that stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I'm interested to see what they do with it. It has a new art style, which is really nice. And it seems to be a little bit more narrative focused. They've narrowed the focus of the story to a smaller number of years within the Sengoku period. So they may go into a bit more depth with various characters, which would be good to see as well. I am very keen. I do like my Samurai Warriors. All right, so on that, let's, uh, let's go to some music. I think we should go to some Samurai Warriors music because I said so. Um, we'll do that and we'll come back and we'll talk about the GBA.
Welcome back, everybody. Okay, so in the last week, Nintendo made the announcement. It's not really an announcement. They reminded everybody that the GBA has been around for 20 years as of this week. It came out in Australia 20 years ago, and it was a great console. And it got a lot of people reminiscing about the console uh, and the games they played on it. Got some people, i.e. me, quite annoyed that <laughs> they're pretty hard to play these days because Nintendo's never bothered to do a virtual console or anything like that. Imagine how good it would be if Nintendo did like a GBA Mini, like the Super NES Mini and the NES Mini, but it was just like, like a, a regular size GBA. <laughs> yeah, just a regular size GBA, but they just preloaded, you know, 30 games on it and then sold it as a console. I mean, they're doing that with those kind of Game & Watch things, like the Super Mario Brothers and the Legend of Zelda one. They could do a GBA Mini. It'd sell like crazy. Really Everybody would. would buy it. Everybody would buy it because you could easily get 30 great games onto that console. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about the GBA on the podcast this week. We'll start by, I guess, chatting about memories about the GBA. Did you guys get get them, you know, when they were new? Yes. Uh, you GBA gamers? Trent, go first. Yes, I, I had the um, original and I didn't get an SP and I didn't get a micro. But I did have a lot of strong nostalgicness for the micro, so I ended up buying one probably like five, seven years ago, sort of thing. So you had the one with the screen that was impossible to see? Yes. <laughs> that was the great thing about the GBA. Everybody was buying the original model GBA, which is the kind of the widescreen one or the kind of the landscape format one. Uh, it was a great console, but the... It didn't have a backlight, so the viewing angles on that thing were insane, and you used to have to twist and turn and contort yourself in all kinds of directions to just be try to be able to see what was going on on the screen. They fixed that with the SP by putting a what well, was a front lit, wasn't it? They they put lights into it um, for the SP, but <laughs> yes, those of us who were early adopters of the GBA definitely remember becoming gymnasts in trying to find a place to actually see the screen of that thing. To be fair, our eyes were way better back then. <laughs> it, it, it is true. It is true. I actually, uh, I, I've also got the Game Boy Color, you know, early model uh, or the you know, original GBC. And every time I try and play those consoles now, I find it impossible. I can't. I can't actually find a spot to to sit to to play those games. Yeah, back those or, screens are so small. The, so the crazy small thing and so is... dark. It's, when it's you just... buy like a GB remake on Switch, like the Final Fantasy Adventure or something like that, and you play it on pixel for pixel, and you see how small the screen used to be compared to how big the Switch handheld screen is now, it's just mind blowing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, definitely, the quality of life of playing these consoles has improved in the years since. Today's kids just don't know what it was like <laughs> being, being a gamer back in the day. It was. It wasn't just that the games are more advanced and stuff now. It's also just much physically easier because you don't need to crunch over the screen to try and see the action. It's, yeah. I have fond memories of that, though. I'm getting nostalgic right now. Uh, Harvard, you have one. Did you, which, which GBA models did you have? Yeah, this is, this is probably me showing my age, but the first games anything I ever had was the GBA SP. And I got into gaming pretty late into my teen years, but I got that and Pokemon Sapphire. And I played that for thousands of hours. <laughs> and Let me guess what SP you had. You had the silver one, which was like branded with, what was it, like a shoe or some sort of weird branding promotion they had with some company at the time? And you've got no, that one. No. Just a regular GBA SP. <laughs> it was silver, you're right, but no weird shoe branding. Uh, yeah, and I'm, pro I'm pretty sure I still have it in a, a cupboard somewhere, though I'm not sure if it still works, unfortunately. Oh, you, it, it would still work. Nintendo's older consoles never died. <laughs> they never stopped working. They were built like machines. Huh? No, they, they were built to last. Um, yeah, that was one of the qualities of those. I never actually had an SP. I only ever had the original model GBA and used that right to the end. Um, so, yeah, I never got to enjoy the, the backlight or the front lid <laughs> um, experience that came for me with the DS. But my brother had a SP. I think for me, the the SP's kind of, the clamshell thing was a really neat design, but it made the actual console quite small. 
um, which was hard for my hands. I preferred the kind of the the landscape for just sitting in the hands. But uh, okay, so Harvard, you had Pokemon Sapphire as your first addiction <laughs> to video games. Trent, what games were you kind of playing on the GBA? Which ones kind of stand out for you as at least, if not the first games you played on the console, the games you played the most? I think in terms of first, I probably would have had Ruby, um, not Sapphire. <laughs> <laughs> um, def- definitely Golden Sun was a big game for that yeah, era. Yeah, that was a great game. Um, that I really like, you know, when I go on about like Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, which also, hey, it was also on the Game Boy, I can bring it up. Um, <laughs> um, the That sort of introduction stuff I really love in Golden Sun, like that all the rain and, you know, that whole, you know, you have to go to like the temple on the top of a hill. Like that's, that's my Final Fantasy snow level, but like in uh, Golden Sun, like it's really good you know, character design and storytelling. I do remember that very fondly. The opening for Golden Sun 1 was excellent design. But the opening for Golden Sun 2 was awful. Yes, and that's what turned me off the game, because it just... It just, <laughs> just felt... talked for, like, 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, and you just felt dumped into the game. Like, it is, if you... it Like, yes, I played the original, but if you just jumped to the second game, you would have been like, well, what do I do? Like... It just seemed very, you're in like this, like I get the point that it was meant to be in like a mysterious sort of like you're on the other half of the island, but it just seemed, but it didn't seem anything to grab me or make me interested in doing what I was meant to be continuing. It felt like I didn't remember what I should have been doing. Like I, like what was the point of continuing the adventure sort of thing was like once I got to the stage, I'm like, why am I going to the towers? Why am I getting the Earth Emerald things? Like that, it just seemed lost. I think. Yeah, the, the last stage. That game got the um the secret of mana treatment, where the devs were much more ambitious with the design. I could be wrong, but I feel like they originally tried making it for the N64, so they had a really big plot and a big system and everything. And then they got told, okay, we're going to put it on the GBA, and the cartridge size is not big enough, so we're going to split it in two. And the first half of the game ended up being Golden Sun, which was very easy and very introductory. And the second half ended up being The Lost Age, which was stupidly difficult from the very beginning. Definitely would have been made better as a one cohesive game. Yeah, as game. one game. They need to re-release that. This is one collection. Uh, I would buy that so fast. True story, Golden Sun was the first time that me as a game critic, this was me as a very young game critic back then, me as a game critic got in trouble with the gamers because <laughs> I got in a lot of trouble for my review with that one. I gave it uh, my first gig as a journalist, games journalist, was working for a, an enthusiast site which doesn't exist anymore. It was called GBA Central, and um, I got onto there as a, a critic and I reviewed Golden Sun. I gave it a six out of ten, I think. Um, and that caused a wave of anger. That caused so many people got furious at me for daring to give Golden Sun a six out of ten. Uh, and this is in the days before Twitter, of course. And everybody was on bulletin boards back then. And GBA Central had a bulletin board, and it just melted down with everybody yelling at me um, on the the forums. <laughs> that, that was that was when the Nintendo fans were really rabid as well. That was when... They've always been rabid. No, but they still are. They still are. They're Harvard, Harvard. <laughs> I guarantee you, they, they, nothing has changed in that regard. They absolutely still are. <laughs> I, you I just still remember get the it. year when um, Twilight Princess came out and GameSpot gave it an 8.8 .8, and everyone was angry that 8.8 .8 was too low of a score. Yep. I guarantee you um, that... They, they still do that. 100% Harvard. <laughs> they still do that. Okay, uh, but I'm not yes. taking any Nintendo codes ever again. <laughs> But yes, I did uh, I, I did cop a lot for my little review of Golden Sun. I thought it was a good game. I mean, for me, the thing was, Golden Sun seemed to be this this decent attempt to take the super uh, sorry the the PlayStation style of RPG, the Final Fantasy style the, that was going all the rage at the time, you know, and put it in a handheld thing. And that was the kind of the point of it. That that was why people were so invested in it was because it was this full scale kind of console quality JRPG, but in a handheld form. Um, but for me, it had so many flaws that just annoyed me. 
uh, one of the big flaws was the fact that if you were targeting an enemy that one of your other characters killed, then the character just reverted to defense rather than targeting a different enemy by you know, automatically. That was something that was a, a feature of really early era JRPGs, but was phased out for good reason uh, very early on, even as far back as the Super Nintendo. Then there was also the puzzles in the dungeon design. I hated that. I absolutely hated the fact you had to solve puzzles while also dealing with random encounters. That just annoyed the heck out of me because I'd be trying to backtrack to get a gemstone to stick in some stupid dragon's eye or something. And then I'd be getting swamped by enemies, which was both disrupting to the flow of the game and the flow of the puzzle logic. And it just, it also created this tension in me where I felt like if I was running out of health, uh, what do I do? What do I do? Do I have to, what, what if I go down the wrong path and have to backtrack? It, it just, it gave me anxiety. So I, I was not a fan of Golden Sun. Uh, I, I really enjoyed its presentation. I really enjoyed its narrative. I thought the, you know, the art was gorgeous, but yeah, the design of it just annoyed me. And I think that's personally, I think that's why Golden Sun has not survived as a series. I know they tried one on the DS, which wasn't all that well received, and that's it. It's been tapped out at three. I think it's because the under the, the fundamental mechanics of Golden Sun are flawed. So yeah, I don't know if either if you have tried to play Golden Sun more recently. But I'd be no, interested. I I I'd be like interested. The nostalgia would. Yeah, I'd be interested away. to see how much of it, you know, now that you're older and more jaded and cynical, <laughs> uh, how much of your fond memories of Golden Sun is based in nostalgia as opposed to, you know, a, a memory of what the game's actually about. Because I actually did play them fairly recently. Nintendo released them on the Wii U as virtual console titles, and I gave them a go and was reminded that. Um, there was a lot that annoyed me about those games. I do think that they've aged better for me in the sense that I can focus more on their merits now than be annoyed by their weaknesses. But yeah, I I, I've, I was I always had a controversial opinion about Golden Sun. So I wonder if, if it, that's why I don't like the sequel like that much. Like the and DS the game. DS and for me the DS one I actually enjoy a little bit better. For for uh, I feel like the DS one has more story to it. And the original one, a lot of my memories are like focused on the story and like uh, visual scenes like the rain and going to the mountain sort of thing. Like that's what I fondly remember about the game, not like, oh, do this weird puzzle thing, like, you know, collect the emeralds, the towers, you know, the battles. Like, you know, I do vaguely remember it being a bit grindy near the end, but. All my fond memories are like, oh, you go to the market town to like go across the lake. You know, that was really fun and exciting. Like nothing about the gameplay itself, just all the characters and the locations was my fond memories about the game. So that's probably why I don't like the second one as much, maybe. Yeah, the Possibly. second one, just I think the difficulty was the real thing that, that stopped it from taking off because... The the second one starts with these really difficult dungeons. I think around two to three hours into the game, you go to Ayers Rock, or Uluru as we now call it, where um, you spend more than an hour trying to get to the top of the rock, and then another hour to go inside the rock for the second part of the dungeon. And at the very end of it, you get this skill that you need to advance. And the audacity of playing a dungeon like that so early into the game, I feel like would have stopped a lot of young players right in their tracks. I don't remember that much of the sequel. I do remember that I played it and gave it an even lower score, but <laughs> I didn't I didn't get anywhere near the same wave of anger, whether it was because people were sick of me by then or they all recognised that this was not as good a quality of a game. But... What I do remember of the second is they did try and do the whole Final Fantasy, you, you've you got a boat now, you can go anywhere you like, which I thought was great until I realised that they were very bad at telling me where I needed to go next. Uh, and Final Fantasy has always been very good at directing you. Often it's subtle. like They, they won't explicitly say, now you need to go to this place. But just the design of the world was very good at guiding you through it. And I felt like Golden Sun... The second one, I got lost a lot. That's the, my main memory of that game. I just got lost a lot because they were so bad at actually guiding you through it. Um, but anyway, that's uh, 
if you do get a chance to play Golden Sun, definitely do so. It was it was the game that every was was every everybody was talking about with the GBA. It was definitely iconic to that console. So it's worth checking out just for a historical perspective. But yeah. If you've got a Wii U, you can still play it. You can go and download it off the virtual console now. And if you don't, you just you're just screwed. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you don't, then there's a little console company called Ambernick that <laughs> operate out of China. They create little consoles that you uh, you put certain files onto, and then you can play your old games on them without me saying anything more before Nintendo's lawyers knocking on my door. But yeah, there are there are ways to play these games still that I highly recommend given that Nintendo refuses to do anything with them, uh, you may as well do something yourself to play them. Were there any uh, other native JRPGs to the GBA, or was it all just ports of um, SNES I mean, games? The ports were excellent. The three uh, Super Nintendo uh, Final Fantasy games that were put onto the GBA were all excellent ports. They were the... I would even go as far as to say they're the way to go to play those games. For ninety nine percent of people, unless you want to go really hardcore, old school, and play, you know, Final Fantasy four on the Super NES, I, uh, the the GBA ports of those three games were just spectacular. And yeah, I've heard good things about the PSP port as well, but that's a bit less accessible, I think. Yeah, the the I I think you're right. I think it's a little bit less accessible. I think the GBA ones are easier to come across if you are willing to use one of those Ambony consoles, um, but. Yeah, the, the, those games were all good. Um, were there any other native JRPGs that I can think of off the top of my head? Oh, yes, the Tales game that was released on the GBA. Or was that just a port? Fantasia. Yeah. That was a port of the SNS game. Oh, there you go. That was that a was great game. But that yeah, was a port. great game. Yeah, I played... That was my introduction to Tales games, actually. That was the first one I played. It was good. I, I was a bigger fan of it than most of the later games in the series. Um, yeah, it was nice and simplified, and you always felt like you were doing something. And I always will remember the sequence in a dungeon where the floor hurts you, but the protagonist is an idiot, and he drops like a key item down a bunch of stairs, and he needs to walk <laughs> through the painful floor to get to it. <laughs> it was always the funniest part of that game. Um, there was also one, of the, I think the one that I always remember off the top of my head that I played a lot... Um, it's not original, but it was a collection of games. The fi- uh, the Fantasy Star Collection, which Fantasy actually... Star Collection. Yeah, it actually ended up becoming a ridiculously rare cartridge. Uh, I got a review copy of it and then looked up the value of it at one stage and it was worth a fortune <laughs> because it got released in such limited quantities. But it was just a port of Fantasy Star 1, 2, and 3. And having those three games on a cartridge and ready for on-the-go play was actually really cool. Because that was my introduction to Fantasy Star as well. Those are all brutally difficult JRPGs. Did they um, have the map for those games? The manual had the map for Fantasy Star 2, yes. Because oh, you, can, okay. you cannot play Fantasy Star 2 without the map. It's yeah, absolutely, absolutely essential. Can't. Even with the map, it's kind of difficult. Because the well, yeah, are like that's, everywhere. That's exactly right. And yeah, the, the developers realized that. Because yeah, the, the, the maps are absolutely essential for Fantasy Star 2. You can't get through them without it. Uh, and Fantasy Star 3 was really good because it had branching kind of generations where you choose a character to marry. And it was because it was a primitive JRPG. It was literally that, who do you want to marry, this character or this character? And then you just pick somebody. There was no kind of relationship mechanics in there. It was just at a point in the plot, you get to choose which character you wanted to marry. But then the next generation would be your protagonist for the, you know, for the next chapter of the game. And that had an epic feel to it. I think there were three generations that you would play through. Um, Speaking of marriage as well, Harvest Moon was a really great game. Oh, I yes. I just Harvest remembered Moon about it. On, it's a, yes. So it's not a JPG, but it was native to the GBA. And that was an incredible, incredible You were talking about Friends, Friends of Mineral Town. Yeah, Friends Town, of Mineral Town. So much to do in that game. And Yeah, but it wasn't a wonderful life. Like, <laughs> it, it, out of the two from that era, a wonderful life was top tier. And everyone else bought the Game Boy game and was like, yeah, Game Boy game version, really good. Because it was more closer to the classic Harvest Moon. Whereas A Wonderful Life was what they should have continued all the 3D games post, but they never did. No. So it's Trent, the Trent, only good 3D Harvest Moon game. Trent, stop. <laughs> Friends of Mineral Town is the best. <laughs> it is the pinnacle of that series. And that's why they remade it for the Switch. So 
You're Friends wrong. Friends of Mineral Town was so strange because you'd think that, was it Natsume back then, would have realized they had a winning formula, but then on the DS, they just kept doing it wrong. They made three games on the DS and they were all kind of bad. Yeah, well, I mean, look at where Natsume is now and where Harvest Moon is now. They obviously don't really understand their own property. Mm. Um, oh, there's, I mean, the obvious other one is, we'll probably talk about the whole, this over a whole section. Uh, the other obvious native JRPG to the GBA was Fire Emblem. Oh, yes, definitely. It was the first Fire Emblem to come out in the West. It was the first time they gave it either localization. And I became a lifelong fan of Fire Emblem as a result of that game. I played the original Fire Emblem through about 60 times, I would have to say. Now, I didn't finish it most of the time because Fire Emblem had these really this really unique kind of progression system whereby there was no way to grind up levels. And there was no way to replay old levels. So if you weren't leveling your characters right, you would hit a wall. It may be 20 levels in, maybe 22 levels in, maybe a little bit earlier or later. But you would hit a wall where the level actually became impossible because you haven't leveled your characters up right from the first stage. So that was um, that was certainly not the most accessible way to do progression through a game. Uh, we should but actually just talk about tile I appreciate I, I appreciated that. Um, so we will we'll do a whole section looking at that one and Fire Emblem Tactic. Uh, sorry, fi- Final Fantasy Final Tactics. Tactics and Ogre on, Battle and Yuga Dream Oni, Union. Oni Musha Tactics. That was another one that was yeah, excellent. Yeah, and there was this new Hacker Show game which was surprisingly good. Those tactics. Yep. So we'll talk about those in the next section. But um, another one I wanted to quickly mention that I spent a lot of time playing was actually licensed. Um, the Lord of the Rings games on the GBA were excellent. Uh, the Harry Potter ones are pretty good I have too. some opinions about that. No, okay, sorry. I should qualify. The Hobbit, uh, the Fellowship of the Ring game that was released on the GBA was a Warner Brothers one because back then there was this really weird split where two companies had the licenses for Lord of the Rings. EA had the license for the films, right? Um, Warner Brothers had the license for the books. So what you had, and the films were coming out at the same time, so what you had was both EA and Warner Brothers creating games where Warner Brothers was making them kind of like the film, but enough different that they could say, hey, this is actually based on the book and meets the license requirements there. EA was just making films that were games that were adaptations of the films. Now, EA got a company called Gryptonite to make two games for the GBA, which were based on the second and third game, uh, films. There was The Two Towers and then uh, Return of the King. They were basically Diablo clones um, for the GBA. So they were loot grindy. You kill a lot of orcs. You get a lot of you know, increasingly powerful items. Oh, I do you remember get, this, actually. You get, that was a good game. You get rare items, which were kind of you know, glowy and stuff. You had about six different characters to choose. If you had a link cable, you could do, you know, multiplayer co-op. And we did, I had a link cable and I played it a lot with my brothers. So we did do a lot of the co-op stuff as well. It was the full Diablo experience really in a GBA format. And I really loved that. And then there was one other one that EA produced, which was called, um, what was it called? The Third Age. So the third age on the big consoles on the GameCube and PlayStation 2 was a Final Fantasy X clone in every single way since the word. It was just literally the mechanics of Final Fantasy X, but with Lord of the Rings. But on the GBA, it was this tactics uh, game, tactics strategy game, which had unique mechanics that to this day I haven't really seen anybody else do. And it was really interesting. And it really worked. Um, it was It was excellent. I think it was probably the... It's the most niche G- uh, GBA game that I think virtually nobody has played, but it is one that I spent a lot of time playing and would highly recommend if you get a chance to check it out because it was, it, for me, EA actually looked after the Lord of the Rings license really well. It was, yeah, uh, was, it was unfortunate the... they, it was unfortunate they, that they lost it, but then I see what EA is like today and I realize <laughs> that it's, probably, it's probably for the best because otherwise the Lord of the Ring game that they'd be creating would be really bad looter shooters for some reason i don't know how Star but was battlefront yeah. lord of the rings Le- legolas would go around with like an auto shooting you know, automatic <laughs> bow 
and he'd just be yeah. <laughs> it would it would they would not be good games. Uh, EA's lost their ability to make good games, but back on the GBA, they gave me a lot of entertainment with their Lord of the Rings content. So yeah. Do you play the Fellowship game? The Fellowship game was absolutely terrible, but it that was, was so by, bad. I was so that, confused. That was by Warner Brothers. That was by the other guys. So yeah. Warner it's... Brothers never made a good Lord of the Rings game, and I say that knowing full well that somebody on the podcast is going to now yell at me because of the Shadow of Mordor. Yeah, but that was terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no I, yeah. I I agree with you there. No, sh- sh- like Mo- the Mordor game, I really wanted to like enjoy, and I. You know, I was part of a hype cycle. I was really into it. And then I played it and then I got like halfway through, which is probably more closer to like one third of the way through, not really halfway. But then I'm just like, this is shit. This is boring. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, that was that was a terrible attempt to take Assassin's Creed and just stick it wholesale into Lord of the Rings with a, yeah, I mean, that Nemesis system that they had going was interesting enough, but not interesting enough to actually play. So, yeah, I, I was very disappointed with how Warner Brothers handled everything to do with the Lord of the Rings. Meanwhile, EA was out there creating that really great strategy game, which we can no longer play because they've lost the license to. Um, War of the Ring, that was so good. I spent so many hours playing that on PC. And then there were all these GBA games that were great, as well as the kind of action games on the consoles. But Lord of the Rings was good under EA. But on that note, we're going to go to a break and then we're going to come back and talk about Fire Emblems and other tactics RPGs on the GBA. What music shall we have? Um, Harvard, give us a music track. Uh, Final Fantasy Battle on the Big Bridge. Welcome back, everybody. Okay, so for this section, we're going to talk about more GBA stuff. We do love the GBA, so we're going to make this a themed episode of the podcast, I guess. Um, because once again, we, we definitely want to recommend people, if you get a chance, go and play, find some way to play some of these GBA games. Uh, because Nintendo doesn't seem interested to put them on the Switch and make them accessible to people. As far as I'm concerned, that makes it totally morally okay to find them via other means and... There is that company called Ambonic that create those consoles so you can have the full GBA experience on the go and just load it up with all the classics because they are too good to let die. 
So we're going to talk about one particular genre that was very well populated on the GBA, um, the Tactics RPG. I think from memory, and I might be wrong here, but from memory, actually Fire Emblem kicked it off. I think Fire Emblem was so successful that after that, we just got swamped by Tactics RPGs. I'm pretty yeah, sure. I think... I'm, I'm pretty sure Final Fantasy Tactics came after Fire Emblem. I'm pretty the, sure. The PS One Final Fantasy Tactics, you mean? No, no, the, the Final Fantasy Advanced, Tactics, right? Yeah. I think Advanced definitely did come out after. Yeah, I'm but pretty yeah, sure. And... There was a lot of Tactics games. Yeah, so Fire Emblem. from memory, from memory, this is very vague memory. I haven't actually looked it up, so I may well be wrong. But at least in in in, in the order I played them, Fire Emblem came out first, and it was popular and successful and all of that stuff. And then Final Fantasy Tactics Advance came out and it was a big thing as well. Between those two games, they just kicked off an absolute flood of tactics RPGs, which included a sequel to Fire Emblem. Um, what was that Sacred called? Stones. Sacred Stones. The game which, actually beats. Yeah, it, Sacred Stones was a game that was a lot more friendly to the player. It did have the ability to grind up levels and stuff. So it was, it was definitely the more accessible of the two Fire Emblems on the GBA. There was also um, a, just a huge number of tactics RPGs that were like uh, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. So there was an Ogre Battle Tactics, which was excellent on the GBA. Um, I mean, Ogre Battle's always been good, but the GBA one was was particularly good. There was also Onimusha Tactics. So Onimusha was a horror-themed action series on the PlayStation 2. For some reason, they just arbitrarily decided they were going to do a tactics RPG in that universe on the GBA, and it worked pretty well. That was actually a pretty decent game. There was also Rebel Star Tactics. I don't know if anybody remembers that one. Never heard of that. Right. So Rebel Star Tactics was basically XCOM. It was actually by the XCOM inventor. Oh, and interesting. He went away and made this really kind of um, neat xcom like tactics game it had the perspective of final fantasy tactics but it had mechanics that were taken from xcom and it was very good it was very underground i think it came out really late in the gba's life um so it was never it never really turned too many heads but it was actually a very good game itself what else was there there was also a enhanced port of shining force oh, of course there would have been you know uh, what was it called? Resurrection of the Dark Dragon or something? I think that was the subtitle of it. Uh, and that was a good game. That was a very good game as well. Have I missed should, any... Should we lump the Advance Wars games into it as well? I mean, the Advance Wars games were... I, I don't think they're tactics RPGs. I mean, the tactics games, they're not RPGs. I certainly think that the Advance Wars games would appeal to people that enjoyed Fire Emblem in particular um, because they are very structurally similar in terms of the way that the levels play out. It's just that Advance Wars doesn't have levels. It has the ability to create units instead. So, But yeah, I, I do think that they are beloved by the same crowd. So yeah, we can include them there. But yeah, There's if a you... bunch of licensed uh, tactics games as well, if you're heavy for translations. there's a, I definitely remember there being a Naruto one, and there's a Yu Yu Hakusho one, there's probably a Yu-Gi-Oh one, just the same kind of gameplay, but with characters that you know from anime TV shows. I didn't know that. Uh, I wasn't that big into anime back on the GBA, to be honest. Uh, so I didn't really follow what was happening in that scene. But yeah, if that's if they were creating a whole bunch of tactics RPGs as their way of handling those licenses, that's pretty neat as well. So every shonen uh, anime had a few different games. They would inevitably have a old school style RPG, and then they would have like a platform combat kind of game, and then they would have a tactics RPG. And this is true for just about every shonen series. So there's one, there's one of each for One Piece. There's one of each for Naruto. There's probably one of each for Bleach. Yeah, that's. It's a pity they didn't keep that going. I would love to play a Bleach Tactics on. Yeah, on yeah. They, so they used to <laughs> they used to skin games with anime licenses, and then they went through a phase of just we're gonna make Ultimate Ninja Storm, but with every property, and that was that just became what it was. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Um... I, the only the only licensed tactics RPG I've played in ages was the Transformers one on the Switch, was which was actually pretty decent. I do hear that one was good, actually. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of XCOM for kids, but with Transformers license, it was neat. Um, it, I think the genre would have done better for it, the genre. Kind of suits 
especially games that or and properties that have large casts. The genre suits um, licensed titles, I think. Oh, and Super Robot Wars was GBA too, wasn't ah, it? Ah, yes, of course. Of course. So I guess the question is, what what do you all think? Why why do you think the GBA was such a, a home for this genre? This kind because of... it didn't have enough buttons. Because it, you reckon buttons. that? It's just a solution for not I having I genuinely buttons. think because the screen's small enough and because the processing power could do decent graphics but couldn't do lots of things on the screen at once and because they didn't have enough buttons to do true action games, yes, they had to do t um, tactics RPGs. Interesting. Interesting. So you don't think there's anything... You, so you think it's a mechanical thing as opposed to there being something about the GBA which suited the genre as well? Like a, I think a, a it's almost definitely... Quality? I think also the idea that it's portable, so you can do like a level pretty easily. You can save whenever you want. But mostly because you can, you can have incredible depth with a D-pad and two buttons in strategy RPGs, whereas you couldn't do that for a lot of action-based genres. Like, imagine a, a fighting game with an A, a B, L, R. You couldn't do very much with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, they did do fighting games on the GBA. And, and no one remembers them because they were bad. <laughs> well, I, I remember the, um, the Street Fighter being pretty well received on the GBA. See, I am remember and Street Fighter well. not being hyped up until the DS. Like, the Game Boy era, I don't remember me like it being that big, but the DS one, as soon as the DS one was got, like a launch title, everyone was like, buy Street Fighter, you're going to love it sort of thing. So I think maybe the Game Boy era was like getting fans and people playing it and it probably had a small little community, but I didn't think it didn't think it take, took off in the Nintendo space until the DS uh, Street Fighter because everyone's like, oh, no, there's nothing to play on launch. Let's buy Wait, Street Fighter. You, you mean the 3DS because the 3DS was the one time that oh, yes, fighting 3DS. games went portable yes. because there was a circle pad and because there was face buttons. That's why we got Street Fighter and... I think Tekken and Dead or Alive all in the same launch window is because yeah that that Dead or Alive on the the 3DS was excellent yeah fan so, it just felt like the console it, this felt, no. felt like the console game right whereas the no, GBA no, no. It, was, it was it was just, just fan service in 3D dude it was like up up upskirts with full 3D going that's why people got into that one um, that game just a sidetrack do you remember how that game got banned no what. It it's got bad. banned. It got banned in Sweden and Australia or something rather for a while, um, because the instruction manual um, next to the character bios. So each character had a little bio in the instruction manual, and I think it was Kasumi, or was it Hitomi? Oh, it was one of the one, characters. One, one of the characters next to their name had question marks instead of an, oh. an, a name for their <laughs> for, instead of a number for their age. So it had like age, and then all the other characters were you know nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, whatever. And then this one character had like question mark, question mark, question mark, and yeah, the game, the game got all kinds of slammed for that. And funny story, that was actually as far as the legend goes. Anyway, that was part of the reason that uh, that um, Curry Tecmo was like, well, screw this. And they created Murray Rose as a kind of parody of the fact that that game got banned for such a stupid reason. Um, anyway, that's how the legend goes. Going back to the GBA, uh, I, I definitely think that fighting games were a bit beyond it. There were some fighting games that were pretty well received at the time. The Tekken Advance game was pretty well received. I would imagine that if at some point Nintendo does do a GBA mini, Tekken Advance will probably be on it because it was quite smooth it was quite playable um and the other one i actually spent quite a lot of time playing on the gba as far as fighting games go was dead uh mortal kombat dark alliance was it dark alliance deadly alliance deadly alliance oh, whatever there, or, there's so many that makes sense yeah there's, there's there's so many dark alliances or deadly alliances or whatever that it's hard to keep up but yeah the the 3d mortal kombat that they put on the gba was actually pretty decent as well so i played that quite a lot um but yeah, I, I definitely think that the tactics RPGs were better suited for the GBA, uh, mechanically and structurally. But I reckon, you know, the thing is, I, I think that it was also a way for developers to give players a lot of content um, for the size of the games that were allowed on the GBA, that the, the cartridges yeah, definitely. Allowed. Because if you think about it, um 
it was a lot of work to get big gains onto the GBA. Even Golden Sun, which we mentioned in the last one, they basically needed to split their game concept in two to make it work on GBA because they just there wasn't as no, enough size, memory processing, or whatever. But in the meantime, uh, my brother was especially into Final Fantasy Tactics, for example. His clock by the time he finished the game was something like 130 hours. Now, the only way you was going to get to 130 hours was via the tactics format, I think, because each level is about an hour long to play through. Um, there's a lot of... They, they can make it quite easy to put a grind in there, um, forcing you to replay levels and so on. So I think that the tactics genre was the content genre on the GBA, as much as I hate saying that, yeah, because I, I, like, agree. I, I like the genre and I hate talking about content. But... Yeah, it, it was definitely where the hours would be piled up. I mentioned before I played Fire Emblem like 60 times because, well, in part because it was structured in a way to, to become impossible to play if you didn't play it right, but also just it, it was a very long game. They were very I remember long. That, um, sorry to diverge off strategy RPGs again, but I remember that the GBA also had a lot of racing games. And because this was, they could do the SNES Mode 7 style of racing really well. But they couldn't store enough content onto them, so you'd be done with the game in about four or five hours because you'd have run through all the tracks of the cartridge to hold. But yeah, definitely, you would spend so much more time on the tactics games because all they needed was a couple dozen sprites, and they could make so many permutations and iterations of content that you'd just be playing in a field new for the hundredth hour. Yeah, yeah. So I think that was part of it. Um... Do you think also the um the especially with Fire Emblem, it taught Western audiences how to play and appreciate those games? Because I know there's been experiments with that genre on earlier consoles, but they never really took off in the same degree. So there was things like Shining Force on the Sega consoles, and well, I mean there was Langrisser, uh, which came out in the West as War Song. That was that was localized at a time where Fire Emblem wasn't. So for a lot of people, actually Langrisser. Especially in America, I don't think Langrisso got a release in the West. Uh, it's sorry, familiar in, name to in, me. In, in Europe and Australia, but in America, it was definitely a Genesis game. Uh, and a lot of people in America, I know, have this really fond memory of Langrisso and were really keen on the remakes of Langrisso 1 and 2 on the Switch because that was their memory of being introduced to tactics in the same way that I would be all over a remake of the original GBA Fire Emblem um, simply because that was my introduction to the genre. I don't know why it took so long for Nintendo to start localizing those because there was what six Fire Emblems before the GBA one. There was like that. It started there was, in. There was definitely at least two, maybe three Super NES ones, and there was definitely two or three on the NES. So I'm pretty be... sure those were a 64 one and a GameCube one that didn't come out, right? Oh, the GameCube one came out in the West. Oh, did it? Yeah. Oh. Uh, the 64 one may, uh, if there was a 64 one, I don't remember it. I mean, it certainly didn't come out in the West. I don't remember seeing anything about it and whether it came out before or after the GBA one. But anyway, it was the fifth or sixth Fire Emblem to come out. Uh, and for what, I, I'm not sure why Nintendo decided that was the one they were going to localize as their first into the West. Whether it was just Nintendo being quirky and giving something a go that <laughs> they hadn't previously uh, or whether there was something about it that they thought was more palatable to the Western audience. Or, or alternative take, they had no games for the Game Boy. I mean, it, no, they had like so I said, many games for the Game Boy. It, it may well have been that they needed a hole to fill, that they just had this gap in their release schedule and they needed something to come out, and that game was sitting there ready to go. I do think that as an introduction to tactics, you couldn't do better than Fire Emblem. And I think that's why part of the reason that I love Fire Emblem so much. So for people who don't know, Fire Emblem's introduction is 13 chapters of a game. <laughs> um, each the, the, the game is structured that each level is one chapter. The, the introduction is a 13 chapter introduction where you take control of this character, Lin, who everybody knows I love. I love Lin a great deal. Um, Lin is the main protagonist for that introduction. At the end of the introduction, it actually shifts to the other main protagonist, uh, Elliewood. And for the rest of the game, he becomes the main protagonist. So you go through all the kind of... The, it is a long tutorial where each level introduces new mechanics and so on. 
and at the end you have a kind of a boss battle and you win and that chapter is done and then it sh you start again basically from level one with this new set of characters and then go through the game with them you do get to meet lynn and all the other characters again they join your party later on but i i thought that was a that is a remarkably good tutorial because it makes it a story driven experience it isn't something that you kind of roll your eyes at the next time you need to play it every time i replay fire emblem now i i still enjoy that tutorial process because it is narrative driven and that may well be why nintendo saw some potential there for it yeah uh, it, now that you bring that up the few really popular strategy rpgs on game boy had very good tutorial systems right trance no, don't start trying on the snowball level. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, no, you are right. I mean, Fire Emblem Tactics had a really good introduction. That little snowball fight where you learn all the basic mechanics and it's actually just kids throwing snowballs around before the adventure actually starts is a tutorial that's worth studying, like as an example of good game design and onboarding players with everything. So, yeah. And I remember Advance Wars as well had really narrative driven tutorials and i feel like if you just made me read the game book to know how to play that game i would not have gotten into it at all yeah i think it's the thing it's especially back then the genre was maybe not so familiar with people so they did need to be introduced to it in a very soft way uh and i think they did do a good job with that uh the collective industry <laughs> in terms of not throwing too much at players and just easing them in one little mechanic at a time giving them time to learn that mechanic, making sure it was interesting in the process with narrative stuff or in the case of snowball fights, kind of a frivolous, you know, a frivolous kind of approach to the level that lets you just play around with it. And yeah, I, I think if you look at how tactics stuff is introduced these days, there is now a level of assumed knowledge. And the reason that they have that level of assumed knowledge is because of the groundwork that the GBA really set. I mean, you try look. You look at um, XCOM, for example, these days. XCOM being the big tactics kind of experience that everybody talks up. Those games are really difficult to get into if you're not familiar with the genre already. Yeah, and like Fire Emblem as well, you can screw up that game, and you can make it really, really hard to advance if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, the Three Houses is definitely a Fire Emblem for Fire Emblem fans. Um, very good game, but definitely a Fire Emblem for Fire Emblem fans doesn't have the same tutorial experience that the GBA one did. Mostly, right. I'd, like to, I'd like to see them remake that one. I'd love to see them to do to take the Three Houses engine and remake the original GBA one in that, with that style, because, yeah, that would be great. That game had such good great characters. I think that's another thing that was really great about the Tactics RPG. It allowed developers to give you characters that you got really invested in, without having to spend you know, huge amounts of money rendering them, rendering them in 3D, giving them hour-long cutscenes and whatever. It, yeah, for definitely. Whatever reason, for whatever reason, the genre is very character-driven and you kind of grow to love your characters very quickly and take ownership over them because you have so much control over them, I guess. Um, they do it in a very efficient way, and I think that was certainly important for the GBA as well. I, I enjoy the characters of... Yeah, Fire Emblem, whatever, a lot more than I did Golden Sun. I can't even remember. Isaac? Oh, it's Is because... Yeah, Isaac. It's because of strategy RPGs, all your characters fulfill a certain mechanical role in addition to their personality. Yeah, yeah. And so you get a you sense take, of character archetypes. Yeah, you take you take kind of control of them, and then there's that emergent storytelling that, because you're so invested in them mechanically, you write little stories about them, you know, when or in, in your head, that you remember that this character was the one that saved you from the the boss you know or, or took down the boss in one hit you definitely grow attached to your characters by interacting with them mechanically as opposed to relying on their narrative role oh yeah, that's like that in golden sun you know isaac has the earth you know dingin thing and you know but didn't. you could swap them around it was <laughs> yeah they could any character could be anything yeah but you. like the game wanted you to have him be earth the other one be fire and then it wasn't Mia or whatever. It was like the yeah, last one. Isaac, be... Garrett, Mia, and Ivan was the wind guy. And Mia was the water person. 
<laughs> yeah, so they, they obviously wanted you, and the characters were like, blue is water. Like, you make the blue <laughs> character water. Like, you make the red character Garrett fire. Like, come on. <laughs> I just remembered a really good anecdote for the original Golden Sun, which people might not remember. Um, there was a dungeon that they developed where there was a way to accidentally lock yourself in there, and you couldn't get out if you didn't have a certain key item that was missable. And the developers, instead of fixing this, instead wrote a special scene where Garrett, the fire character, just is angry and punches a hole in the cave and you leave that way instead. You really need to look that up. It's a great scene. I um, I just remembered another thing that annoyed me about Golden Sun, actually. Um, the fact that you were constantly being asked for your opinion and your opinion never mattered oh, whatsoever. Yes, yes. Like yes. the game that constantly says, oh, would you like to go down this pathway? And then you've got an option, yes or no. And it never mattered. It never mattered if you chose yes or no. It would still play out exactly the same way. And the cutscenes were filled with these. Every major cutscene would have like five or six times that somebody asked you for your opinion and nobody cared, which I guess is kind of appropriate. I mean, that happens in real life all the time. But it was annoying. If you're going to give players choice in narrative, then then it should have some kind of impact. I think it's almost definitely they did write that into the script and then they realized, oh crap, we can't do this now that we split the game in half. Possibly. You're probably right, actually. You're probably right. But it was still annoying. <laughs> <laughs> it, that, it was that's the game so that definitely was downsized. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, moving back to tactics RPGs, um, without talking about Snowball Scene's Trent, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, was was Final Fantasy Tactics your only tactics RPG on the console? Uh, I think it was, actually. Uh, oh, I think I had an event. No, I think I had one of the Fire Emblems or Advance Wars. I, I, I had one of them at one stage. Um, but yeah, pretty much Final Fantasy Tactics was my, you know, I got this, that's the introduction. I, I didn't actually really have a really large Game Boy Advance collection. Like I probably had, you know, about, you know, I had Final Fantasy Tactics. I had the Pokemon games, had the Zelda games. I had some of the NES classics. Um, and then that was probably about it like the Game Boy Advance era for me was you know gone in a blink of the eye and then I had a DS like <laughs> it, it it did like at the time I was probably playing more console games like I had the GameCube then as well so I was more playing the GameCube and had a larger GameCube collection so right yeah I think um yeah that, that brings up another interesting point uh, the one of the reasons I love the GBA so much perhaps was that was the first time I had my own income <laughs> and I was able to buy games for myself. So I actually ended up with a pretty big library of GBA games, whereas previously I was really relying on Christmas presents or birthday presents to to build up my library. Um, I didn't have as many Game Boy or Game Boy Color games, for example, as I did GBA. That was me in the DS. So I have lots and lots of DS games, but not that many GBA games. Right. So you're still relying on Christmas presents for birthday presents for GBA? Yeah, and that's why I have so many licensed games. Is because <laughs> my dumb self just looked at the character. You saw, like, you I saw, saw them on TV, I'm sure. It must be good. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how it always works, isn't it? All right, we'll go to we'll go to some music and then we'll come back for a little bit more. Um let's have Fire Emblem music. I mean we talked about that a lot.
Welcome back, everybody. All right, so to finish the podcast with the last section, we're going to talk about a feature of the GBA, which was actually pretty neat, very underused, very much forgotten today. But uh, I think it, I, I genuinely think it actually enhanced the experience with both the GBA and the home console. There was the ability to link the GBA to the GameCube via a special cord and adapter. And it was an expensive setup to do because you needed to have a GameCube, four GBAs and four sets of these link cables to get the full experience out of it. But if you were able to get that setup going, it was an amazing, it provided for some really amazing experiences uh, where the GBA would effectively act as a kind of a personal screen and it would allow you to see stuff that wasn't on the main screen. It was the dual screen experience where everybody had their own little personal screen and it had so much potential in terms of the various ways that it could be used. For me, the best application of it was actually a packing title with a Ridge Racer game. So actually it was a it was a Ridge Racer licensed game or a series game, but it was called R Racing because they wanted to separate it from Ridge Racing itself. It was this really weird attempt to do a realistic Ridge Racer. Uh, and that game, the racing game, wasn't very good at all. But people were buying it for the pack-in, which was this Pac-Man multiplayer oh, game. Pac-Man Versus, yeah. It was called Pac-Man Versus. And in that, one person would play as Pac-Man, and the other three players would play as Ghosts. So Pac-Man had the full screen on their GBA. They could see the whole map. The three Ghosts that were trying to hunt Pac-Man down only had a small window that they could see on the main screen each. So the ghosts had to work together with an incomplete picture of the full map. Pac-Man was obviously at a disadvantage because there were three of them, one Pac-Man, but he had the full view of the screen. He had the power pellets. It was otherwise a normal Pac-Man game, but it was just, it was a crazy, crazy addictive um, little mini game thing. And we spent a lot of time playing that because we did have the full setup and it was only possible because of those link cables you know, second screen experience and stuff. I really think that um, that game influenced a lot of what they tried to do with a lot of mini games on the Wii U, especially with that Nintendo Land Park thing. Yeah, the Nintendo it? Land Luigi's Mansion Ghost game was an yeah. excellent game as well. Yeah, and I think that was directly inspired by what they did with Pac-Man Versus. Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, and, but yeah, Pac-Man Versus was the first game to do that, and that really felt great at the time. That was exciting application of technology to link your GBAs to the GameCube together. Uh, there weren't too many other examples of those cables being used, unfortunately. Uh, Crystal Chronicles did, Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles did. I think that was the screen, the second screen was just your inventory then, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I don't think it was a meaningful way to do that, right? It was just a way to have four characters in an RPG on a console. Yeah, I think you could mon manage your inventory there, which was a quality of life thing because can you imagine four people trying to manage their inventories off the one screen? That would have become quite messy. But yeah, other than that, it was a fairly mundane application of it. And then there was also a Zelda game, which Trent played. I never played it. Um, how did they use the four screens for that, Trent? Four screens? Uh, well, you just, it was just four links. So you had like um, each screen was a different link. Uh, the, the game ended up being remade on the 3DS as well. So you, most people played it on the 3DS um, or were able to... Like, I didn't play it too much on the Game Boy Advance, so I didn't play it till the 3DS a lot. Um, so on the 3DS version, they allowed you to control all four links, and that basically was the game. But uh, yeah, the Game Boy Advance one, it was basically you had to pair up with all your friends and stuff like that. Uh, and also it was a controller for the GameCube Four Swords, but... Yeah, I, I played the Four Swords on the GameCube um, by, by myself. <laughs> oh no, you have to play that game with friends. It's actually a pretty good game with friends because it's it's kind of like trying. So it's like Zelda, but you need teamwork to solve the puzzles. So you need to coordinate your friends to go and push blocks at certain times and like sync up things. Like it's actually very well designed for the multiplayer experience. Right, yeah, I mean, I never played it. Um... I don't know why, but just never, never did. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Nintendo's was... Zelda multiplayer concepts are usually pretty interesting, uh, probably worth looking into. Then there was also Triforce Heroes, which was a D- 3DS game, but they're still using that free character concept. So I'm kind of annoyed there's no Switch one which uses the Joy-Cons. It's like, hey, you be Link, you be Zelda or something, and here's the screen. Like, That's true. Yeah, they really <laughs> should do that. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to think why I might not have played it. I think it was just I was going through an anti-Zelda phase at the stage. <laughs> <laughs> I think I bounced off Zelda pretty hard thanks to Twilight Princess, which I've since gone back and re-evaluated. When it came out on the Wii U, I actually discovered I quite liked it. But for whatever reason, I wasn't that in love with it on the GameCube I think I was still experience. I think I was still trying to compare everything to Ocarina of Time and I was expecting everything to be like that, uh, to have that impact on me. And when it didn't, I, I felt like the Zelda series was fading. I think that's it, yeah. So definitely when... Twilight Princess, I remember the intro being really hard to get into. Like it felt like a more of a sloggy sort of game to get like to the midway point. And then once you're there, like you might be like, oh, I don't really want to play it. So that was my experience with Twilight Princess. And then like you, the Wii U version was where I was like, oh, well, this is actually pretty fun. They've done X, Y, and Z changes. It's actually playable now. (laughs) So um, yeah, I imagine probably similar sort of thing there. Yeah, and I think it was also that game, you know, the, the Zelda Four Swords or whatever was just a 2D little thing. And I was in love with the idea of games being pro- games making progress back then as well. I, I was I was a different kind of gamer to I am today. Uh, and, and the reasons that I would have played Four Swords, I think, um, yeah, they just weren't there when I was when the game was new. So I never played it. But yeah, it was it was good tech. It would have been interesting to see more done with it. I'm a big fan of second screen experiences as a rule. Um, we don't have, really have much of an outlet for those anymore. I think it's very difficult for developers to do because you need to have all this additional technology and what do you do if people don't have that, you know, uh, which is why the experiments with using iPads and whatever is second screen experiences has been patchy and generally unsuccessful, I think. It would be nice if some kind, uh, some console had that baked into it at some stage, I think. I mean, the closest we're going to get is the Switch, I think, because you can get... Pac-Man versus on the Switch, and it's really similar to what the original was. And yeah, but it doesn't have the the privacy of the Pac-Man player, right? It does, it does, because you have you have to have multiple consoles. But it's right. the right. same, right. it's the same setup. Like you still link up together, and you still have four ghosts working together against the Pac-Man player. Right. And I imagine WarioWare, when it comes out, is probably going to experiment with some of that as well. Like, I know that WarioWare is always the, the title that Nintendo uses to experiment with the peripherals. Yeah. Maybe they'll have a demo which actually makes the ice, uh, feel the ice or whatever, like the Switch promised. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I guess that's still requiring two, two consoles, though. I'm, I'm talking about second screen experience being like the main screen and then the second screen being something else like, like, the a, Wii U. like a wii u kind of thing oh. yeah like the wii u which was an experiment that was a, a good i i like the experiment that nintendo did with that it didn't quite pan out for them unfortunately which which pretty much guarantees that nobody else is going to try it ever again but if you want games like for example etrian odyssey if you're not going to have it with the two screens on the one console like you did with the the ds the fact that Etrian Odyssey needs the two screens where one screen is the world that you're exploring, the other screen is the map that you're drawing, uh, unless they find some way of bringing that second screen experience to the Switch, we're never going to see another Etrian Odyssey, for example. Um, that would have worked on the GameCube with the GBA, where the kind of the, the main screen was the world that you're exploring, and then the little map would have been on the, the GBA screen. Those things, I, I, I really get into that, um, and I really enjoyed the fact that Nintendo was experimenting with all that stuff back then, because it's definitely led to, you know, that, that experience was what probably informed the Wii U in the end, that they tried to take the GBA kind of pairing up with the home console and then put it all into the one package, which again, unfortunately didn't work for them, but I thought the Wii U was a noble experiment. 
I think that concept like, oh. only really exists now with stuff like the Jackbox mobile games. So, like, you've got your, you know, your main goal on the TV and then everyone pulls out their mobile phone and, you know, they're doing the, the stuff and inputting on the phone. Like, I think that's the only game. Well, it's which definitely, really it's, cool. yeah. it's, it's definitely a, a local multiplayer <laughs> thing because that's entirely what it's about, right? It's about everybody, you know, multiple people having their own personal screens and then a communal screen that everybody's playing off. And what you can do with that, you know, whether you want to give people information on the little screen that other people can't see that works, detective games and whatever would be really neat. But yeah, this is definitely a local multiplayer thing and local multiplayer is hardly the focus of most developers these days. There was one really good experiment that did something similar that I loved on PlayStation VR, which was this bomb defusal game. And the person with the VR headset could see the bomb, right? And that's all they could see. None oh, of the other... Um, keep talking and no one explodes. Yeah, yeah, no. that's the one. And nobody else who was playing could see anything else, but they could go on the internet to access like a huge bomb diffusion manual. So the bomb, the person that could see the bomb needed to describe what they were looking at. And then the other players needed to quickly figure out, interpret that, and then tell them which wires to cut or which dials to, to twist and stuff. That was a great experiment. That was really, really brilliant. And that is kind of the, I guess, the end point of this kind of thing that Nintendo pioneered with the GBA GameCube link up. So anyway, to finish up this podcast, because we have gone quite long, we've talked a lot about our love of an old console. Um, we'll finish up by everybody picking their three favorite GBA games that they remember um so we'll start with you harvard i'm going to put you on the spot <laughs> uh, that's actually really easy because my okay. first one is obviously pokemon sapphire too many hours in that game <laughs> way too many hours in that game yep uh second one is can i lump together all the Yu-Gi-Oh games because there were like 20 of them into sure. just the one because having that card game on the go was actually really incredible because the game worked exactly the way you thought it was going to and everything just made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And my third one, I'm actually, so we didn't mention this, but the Mega Man Battle Network games were very good as well. So maybe that's my third pick. Okay, yep. Those are the RPG ones, right? Yeah, yeah. So they're RPGs, but they have like action-ish combat. It's actually a yep. very smart way to adapt platforming Mega Man into a longer title. I thought it was really well made. Yeah, I do remember those, and I do remember them being pretty good as well. Cool. All right, uh, Trent, your turn. Right. So my first one, I'm going to go with the best remake on the Game Boy Advance. It's called Doom. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, the Doom Game Boy Advance game. It was great. It I didn't was know they pretty... made a Doom yeah. Game Boy Advance game. Yeah, they did them all. There was Doom, there was Duke Nukem, there was Doom 2. They were all pretty good, actually. So, so, so that's one of mine. And then I'm going to go with um, another random game which I played later post Game Boy Advance, though, um, through other means. Uh, Duka and the Monophonic Menace. It's like a, re it's like a simple RPG. Um, you collect some music notes or something. I'm just going off basically my vague memory of it though. Um, but it's really colorful. It's really fun. Uh, you just explore the world and you battle some monsters and it has like a musicy sort of funness. And you make po potions. You like mix up potions and it's great. It's weird. Anyway, so that's probably my second one. And then the last one I'm going to just go be boring and go with uh whatever zelda game was on it uh minish, minish cap. cap yes that was, minish great cap was great yeah minish cap was uh definitely a highlight on that for that whole series all right uh for me i'll go with fire emblem first because fire emblem is fire emblem. i love fire emblem more than most people could imagine and also that was fire emblem with lynn lynn was early era waifu material she was uh she was great she is so good. Uh, okay, so that's that one. Um, you know what? I'm going to say Final Fantasy 1 and 2, Dawn of Souls. That was very good. That was a was, really, really good port. Yeah, it was It was a amazing effort to take the original two Final Fantasies and update them, you know, remake them. They had additional dungeons and features in them, and the graphics were gorgeous. I spent a lot of time playing those two 
that's probably my favorite versions of those two games um, that were put into that pack. And then the third one, I'm going to go with... I did mention it earlier in the podcast, but um, Lord of the Rings, The Third Age. If you ever get a chance to play it, and <laughs> you're going to need to delve into the world of emulation for it because they're definitely never going to remake it anymore, re-release it or anything else. EA doesn't even have the rights to it anymore. They can't do anything with it if they wanted to. But The Third Age is just a unique tactics strategy game with the Lord of the Rings license. It doesn't look great. It's a little bit messy, but the the application of the Lord of the Rings license to just a I, I can't even explain it on the podcast. It is just such a unique tactic system and it worked. It was an excellent tactics game. So that'll be my third pick. I spent a lot of time playing that one. Uh, so there we go. All right. That's everything for the podcast. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Thanks for being on Harvard and Trent and sharing your thoughts about final f- the GBA. And uh, they've gone silent on me. All right. Well, yes, Final Fantasy. Yes, it was great. Game. Final Fantasy. No. The GBA. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on the GBA. That was a very confused couple of seconds there. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in and listening. Let us know your thoughts. And other than that, have a great month of gaming. Play lots of video games. There's a lot coming. See about catching up on some old GBA ones if you can. And we will see you next month. 